This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service Nebula. Hey, happy Friday. This week, Samsung's phone business hit some serious roadblocks, under-display cameras are finally going mainstream, and Microsoft would like you and everyone else to stream Windows from the cloud. Our tech knowledge quiz is a tiered one again, ranging from basic to medium to very hard questions. See how many of them you can get right. Links are in the description and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week start with the Logitech Zone True Wireless Earbuds, which are special because on top of all the regular premium earbud stuff like active noise cancelling and multi-point audio support, these are specifically designed for video calling. So they have an optional USB-A and C dongle for an extra stable connection to your computer, and they are officially certified for pretty much every calling software out there. A pretty interesting approach. Then we have the Apple Magic Keyboard with Touch ID, which just became available as a standalone purchase for Mac users. Motorola released the Edge S Pro in China, which is probably their first real flagship killer, with a 144Hz 10-bit OLED screen, a Periscope camera, a Snapdragon 870, and more, starting under a very aggressive 400 bucks. And finally, the community pick this week was the Micromax In2B. Now, the interesting thing about this phone is that it actually comes with a unit Unisoc SOC, which is becoming a bit of a trend in budget phones, with many manufacturers actually ditching MediaTek and Qualcomm on the low end. And if you didn't know Unisoc, they are actually a Chinese chip designer that used to be called Spretum before. Maybe you've heard of that. We track all of the new releases and their details in our release monitor in the Crowd app, so check that to stay up to date and be sure to upload your favorites every week so I know what to feature next. Links are in the description. Okay, and my first story of the week will be Samsung's phone business going through a bit of an existential crisis. Korean industry insider publication The Elec has reported a so-called special review for the company's mobile business getting kicked off, which is an internal process started when, quote, the top leadership considers that there is a problem with a particular business unit, end quote, and the problem is not a small one. According to Counterport, Xiaomi has overtaken Samsung for the first time ever after an incredibly impressive rally that doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. The Galaxy S21 series is apparently by far Samsung's worst selling S-series flagship in recent memory. The company, according to Strategy Analytics, has fallen to the fourth spot when it comes to 5G phones, behind not just Apple but now also Opal and Vivo. And while it is technically still driving most of the revenue from all the Android brands, its share is starting to shrink too, with the BBK brands combined now having already overtaken it and Xiaomi closing in on them too. Samsung has also lost the number one spot in Europe that was once known as one of Samsung's strongest markets that is now being overtaken by Xiaomi and fast-growing new entrants like Oppo and Realme, and it's pretty much the same picture elsewhere as well. Huawei's collapse left a huge open space on the smartphone market, and it seems like all of it was absorbed by Xiaomi and the BBK brands while Samsung just kept ever so slowly declining. Now, that is not to say that Samsung is out of the game, of course. I think they are uniquely well positioned to take advantage of the new rise of foldables. The mobile business is actually doing quite well in terms of profitability. And except for mobile phones, the rest of the Samsung electronics empire is actually making more money than ever. The memory and semiconductor business is booming all around, including rumors that even Google's new Tensor SoC is at least partially co-engineered and manufactured by Samsung. Tablets and computers are healthy and growing. With the new Wear OS revival, the company is likely to become one of the leaders in wearables too, etc. But it's quite clear that the Chinese phone makers are slowly gaining the upper hand over them in terms of smartphones, unless something changes soon. Okay, and my second story of the week will be under-display cameras being on the rise and all the manufacturers getting in on the fun. After ZTE launching the Axon 30 not long ago, and Samsung gearing up to launch under-display cameras in their new foldables too, we have now learned that Xiaomi will be featuring one in the Mi Mix 4 as well, that is supposed to launch in a few days. And finally, Oppo has released their prototype tech this week as well. Now, the Oppo one is a prototype unlike the other three, so it is a bit of an unfair comparison since this one doesn't have to be mass-producible, but the teasers make it seem basically completely invisible, and the sample photo that 
that they've shared actually looks pretty great. I don't think I would have noticed anything wrong with this image, which is a promising sign for the future. Now, one surprising detail that Universe Ice, the famous leaker on Twitter, has posted is that of the four players, only Samsung is actually going to use Samsung Displays for this technology, while the other three have actually all used three different Chinese display makers, and given that they all use pretty high-end display technologies, it's pretty impressive that they can already compete with Samsung, at least on some level. Now, I personally have never been super bothered by hole punches or notches or anything like that, so I don't think it's going to be a huge decision-making factor for me, but I'd love to hear from you if you are excited about this tech, let me know down in the comments. And I think given that the rate of progress that we're seeing here, these things should probably show up in mainstream flagships in maybe one at most two years, which is pretty exciting. Okay, and my third story of the week will be Microsoft opening up applications for Windows 365 cloud PCs, which is basically allowing businesses to rent virtual Windows PCs in the cloud that their employees can then log into and stream to any device with a capable web browser or remote desktop software. So imagine that you are an IT person and instead of buying each of your thousands of employees that are spread across the globe and are working from home or wherever, a physical PC that meets each of their needs and then delivering it to them and then getting them to install all the right programs and configuring security stuff remotely and so on, you just choose your configurations, give them a login and you're basically set. Of course, there's a little more that goes into it, but employees could probably even run this off of something like Samsung DeX if they wanted to, and all of their files and programs would be in control of the IT admins and not on a random device that they could lose or misuse. Now, virtual desktops are of course not an entirely new concept. I know a guy, for example, who works on a super secret movie project and he actually has to do all the rendering and all the animations and everything on a virtual machine so that he can never actually download the files to his computer and accidentally or deliberately leak them. So this isn't like an entirely new concept, but the difference is that now it's Microsoft doing it directly and they're trying to basically make it mainstream. So this solution runs on Microsoft's own cloud. The setup comes with a single sign-on that handles Windows, Office, and all the management stuff, etc. And prices range between 20 bucks and 150 bucks per month, which is not cheap, but of course these prices are for businesses who might still find it a lot cheaper than deploying and managing physical devices and trying to secure the files and apps on those. Now, whether it is streaming your operating system from the cloud or any other sort of future-looking tech, I love to anticipate and sort of conceptualize whether a new technology will actually change the world and become mainstream or not. And if you enjoyed that kind of thinking, you should check out Engineering the Future on CuriosityStream, which does exactly that. It is a super well-produced documentary series covering various forms of renewable energy, flying taxis, weird chips, and all the other wild stuff in much greater detail than a regular YouTube video could. And it's only one of thousands of documentaries on CuriosityStream covering science, nature, history, and more. CuriosityStream is the premier place on the internet for high-quality professional documentaries from the founder of the Discovery Channel. Many of the hosts are legends like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, Stephen Hawking, and more. And if you use my link, to sign up, you'll also get free access to our own streaming service, Nebula, which is built and owned by some of YouTube's best educational creators. Nebula comes with exclusive originals, for example, Tierzu has just released a new series of Let's Play Outside, where he introduces cheetahs, plus we have all of our regular content there too, of course ad-free without any tracking, and in the case of my tech altar videos, even a day or two early. Signing up really helps to support our content, and the two services combined cost 15 bucks for an entire year year, so you can support us and get great content for a very reasonable price. Check it out, links are in the description, and I'll see you next week.